the expanding of equality includes several different groups. So we're going to be talking about several of them today. Uh, American or Native Americans, Latin Americans, uh, Asian Americans, and disabled Americans, as well as just consumers in general. So we'll give you one minute to get started, then I'll start explaining. So the Latin American equality, uh, the big push on that was for migrant workers. To give you some sense of what we're talking about with migrant workers, back um, nowadays we hear things about building a wall, about border security, things like that. But in the 1960s and dating even further back going through into the Great Depression, we essentially had an open border with Mexico. So migrant workers started out by, they would seasonally come into the United States and work on American farms, helping harvest crops. Um, and once the farming season was over, once the harvest season was over, they would then migrate back to their homes in Mexico or in Central America uh, with the money that they made. Um, so what they were experiencing when they came into the United States to work were very harsh working conditions, very long days, sun up to sun down, uh, very few breaks, little water to work with, very little food provided to them. Um, and so this is what builds the United Farm Workers and what Cesar Chavez is fighting against. He's trying to get common everyday worker protections for migrant workers. And a lot of this was backed by racial sent or, uh, or racial prejudice against Latin Americans. In that a lot of people said, well, they don't even live here, so why do we have to give them the protections that are afforded Americans? And even those that did live in the United States and migrated all over the United States for work, um, again, people were saying, well, you know, they're not, they're not white, so why should we protect them? But Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers uh, used tactics that had been used in the civil rights movement, nonviolent protests and boycotts, and along with powerful leadership like Dolores Huerta, they were able to get worker protections for migrant workers. And along with this is what we have that we call the Chicano movement, which since the United States expanded westward, it enveloped many areas that used to be Mexico, like New Mexico, Arizona, California. And the people who had lived in those areas were just integrated into the United States. And so the Chicano movement was a movement to uh, highlight the contributions of Mexican Americans and Latin Americans to American society that they had been doing since the early 1800s. And again, by showing that they are providing to American culture and American society, therefore they should gain equal treatment within American society. 
with American, or sorry, Native Americans, we see a similar uh, push as well. Is that same with uh, women, uh, and as we just talked about with Latin Americans and Mexican Americans, they're pushing f to increase their political power and civil rights. Native Americans, though, go about it in a different way. They don't model themselves off of civil rights movement uh, tactics. They actually uh, take a more hands-on approach. Uh, and the most visible aspect of this is Native Americans uh, try to take back their land. Um, so there are a couple of different examples of this. The first is, in the timeline, is Alcatraz Island. So Alcatraz Island is a former federal prison that was it's located on an island in San Francisco Bay. And Native Americans got out there and they occupied using the prison as housing and everything like that. Um, and they were going to turn it into an education center as well as living space for Native Americans, claiming that it was their land that was taken from them. Um, and so with this, there was a lot of negotiation. There were tactics of shutting down the power and water to the island. Um, but that occupation ended peacefully. No, but there weren't any casualties or anything like that. Then once that was done, then the Native Americans, uh, particularly the uh, Sioux Nation, decides that they're going to do a protest march, a long march that they took from San Francisco all the way on the west coast to Washington, D.C. on the east coast. And once there, they occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was an old uh, federal department that managed uh, relations between Native Americans and the federal government, and widely seen by Native Americans as an evil organization that took away their rights and their autonomy and their land. And so they occupy that building, uh, wanting to turn it into an embassy for Native Americans, meaning that Native Americans consider them separate from the United States as if they're a separate country and therefore should be treated in that manner. And this all culminates in Wounded Knee. So if we remember from Ameri our previous chapters, Wounded Knee was the site of a massacre in which the U.S. military slaughtered uh, hundreds of Native Amer innocent Native Americans and in, in South Dakota. And so in the 1970s, Native Americans of the Sioux Nation take that site back and they were surrounded by federal authorities. And this resulted in a shootout where two of the American Indian Movement members were killed in the fire exchange between the two sides. So this was all not for anything. And so what this created was new legislation that Congress passed that granted Native Americans their full citizenship, gave them autonomy back on the lands that they, uh, that they owned and that they, uh, I would say occupied, but the, the reservations that they were uh, forced to live on. But in this case is that they were given autonomy, meaning that they have their own separate governments that are distinct from states and even to, in many ways, the United States government. And at least that was enough at that time. But as with any of civil rights movements, it is always continuing. So Native Americans are still trying to uh, make sure that they have the same protections as everybody else, even to this day.
All right, so our final slide here, we start with Asian American rights. While this is still a continuing process, but after, in the 19, uh, late 1960s, 1970s, Japanese Americans specifically start fighting to get, um, to, be re, uh, to be compensated for the property that they lost when they were interred during World War II. So remember, World War II, uh, after the Pearl Harbor strike, Japanese Americans were rounded up and put into prison camps. And all their property was taken by state and federal governments. And it was never returned to them. So uh, Japanese American families um, wanted to be compensated. They, they knew that they couldn't get that property back, but they wanted to be um, given money in exchange for what they lost. And there was an itemized process, so the government, the federal government knew what most of these families lost, and they started to fight for that because that should be, if the government takes anything from you and you're not in debt, you should be compensated for what they take from you. Um, and then, of course, Asian Americans, as they always have been from as soon as they began immigrating into this country or the western coast was absol or absorbed into this country they've been fighting discrimination and so they were lobbying congress to pass additional laws to make sure that uh, that the civil rights act applied to asian americans as well as additional legislation to protect their rights in the 1970s you have the beginning of rights for disabled americans um, and this is um, widely seen back then as this is when you start seeing um, uh, disabled parking spaces close to the front of stores. You have wheelchair ramps. Elevators weren't always a mainstay in buildings. People used to take the stairs a lot. But because if you are f uh, physically handicapped, you may not be able to walk upstairs. So elevators became more commonplace in multi-story buildings. Um, you also see this even in education where uh, students with learning disabilities are no longer taken out of regular schools and put into special, special schools or special classrooms. They are included with everybody else and, uh, and they have you know, either special, uh, special teachers to help them out or they get additional services before and after school. But this idea of separating and segregating uh, disabled people begins to come to an end during the 1970s and it'll culminate when we talk about the Bush presidency in, in the early 1990s. And then also there were, uh, for every American that are, which every American is a consumer, there were a lot of businesses and things that were happening that were hurting Americans from bad business practice to even back then you had gasoline had a lot of lead in it so when cars drove around lead was being put into the atmosphere and people are getting sick like getting cancers and things like that from it so uh, lobbyists like Ralph Nader who is pictured here um, they lobby the government to pass legislation to clean up gasoline to create protection agencies for common everyday Americans to make sure that they're not being taken advantage of by businesses and by, um, by individual products as well. And that's where we'll stop today.